Greetings, this is Eric Andelin, Geospatial Program Manager with the Wantman Group. Two days, nine square miles, and 3,056 images. Why would anybody do this? To begin with, here is our contact information. We will also share this slide at the end of the presentation. This presentation will focus on determining the feasibility of UAS projects, value, if any, of using a UAS over traditional fixed-wing aircraft, mission planning and execution, processing data through to meet client expectations. We will follow this project as an example. I recently posted this project on LinkedIn and it drew quite a bit of attention. Rather than trying to answer questions individually, we thought we would put together this presentation and share it with all of you. Two potential issues here. One, it's within five miles of TPA in Class B airspace. Two, the client needs it next week. You can mitigate the airspace issue with a waiver, but at least for now, the FAA is not likely to approve one in such a short time frame. These days it's taking about 60 to 90 days. Probably more suited for a conventional aircraft. Another example. This one looks okay, no problem so far. Cursory look at the location, puts it in a project area, unpopulated, Class G airspace, nowhere near any airports or other no-fly zones. Wait, what? 4,000 acres? Time to pick up the phone and ask some questions. Could you send me a KML or a shapefile of the area? What's the final deliverable? When do you need it? Can we get access to the property? What's your budget? Probably more suited for a conventional aircraft? but a UAS is certainly an option. Determining feasibility. These are the things you need to look at. Can I operate in compliance with FAA regulations? Will I need a waiver? What are my risks? What are the deliverables? Is my UAS and or sensor suitable? Do I have the right processing tools? Am I capable of producing the deliverables? Am I licensed or certified to provide these deliverables? Can I meet the schedule? And am I cost competitive? Let's say we can meet the schedule, we can mitigate all of the risk, and we can do the operation as required. Are we cost competitive? Let's look at UAS versus conventional aircraft. And believe me, I lean neither way. My family still owns an aerial mapping company in Southern California. With UAS, we have many restrictions. However, the investment costs are low, somewhere around 15K, some a lot cheaper, very few might pay a lot more. Operating costs are low. Just throwing this out there, an engineering survey company is probably in the $100 to $175 an hour for a two-man crew. Some people operate as a one-man operation. Costs increase with the size of the project, more time on site, obviously due to smaller cameras and so forth. UAS are a two-man operation, at least ours are. We operate with a remote pilot and a visual observer. And they're great for small acquisitions. Conventional aircraft, minimal restrictions. However, the investment costs are quite high. If you're looking at a 206 or a 210 with a calibrated aerial mapping camera, full format, you're probably talking a million dollars. Operating costs are also very high. However, the costs do decrease a little bit with the size of the project, less time in the air and or on site. Currently, this is still a two amount operation, pilot and a cameraman. Great for large acquisitions. 
That's not to say they don't do small acquisitions. They still do 40-acre projects, but they excel at larger acquisitions. Let's look at the cost competitive factors. Is the project in Class T airspace or Class B? Basically, how difficult is it going to be for me to get in there with an unmanned system? Proximity. How long will it take to mobilize to the project site? There is good and bad about being ground-based with a UAS. Someone who's ground-based with a UAS has to deal with traffic. And depending on where you live, traffic can really slow down your ability to mobilize. It may even make you non-competitive. How many hours are required to acquire the data? This is based on your UAS and its flight limitations. Deliverable. Will this require field survey support as well? Here an engineering survey company may have a bit of advantage if they're already surveying on the site or, or should I say and or, those surveyors are also trained in UAS operation. Schedule. Is the deliverable time sensitive? For this project, there were no flight restrictions. We were in Class G airspace. Proximity. We were 30 minutes from our nearest office, so mobilization was not an issue. Size. Nine square miles, which we figured would take a little over two days, given good conditions. The deliverable. Mosaic only, no survey required. Ironically, we did have surveyors on site doing other work, but this product was simply a mosaic to update imagery, which was probably being consumed through Google Earth prior to this. Schedule. This schedule was very important. The client was tired of mobilization excuses from the aerial mapping company that they previously hired. So in this case, a UAS is a cost competitive solution. Now it's time to finalize the mission plans and mobilize. Mission planning. Know your system. How large an area can you fly at a given altitude per battery? Know your deliverable. What's the resolution? What kind of accuracy is required? How much overlap and side lap will you need to achieve those? Know your project site. Where are my optimal launch points and landing areas? In other words, what room do I have to work with? Know the conditions. Is this area particularly clear, cloudy, or partly cloudy? If there are clouds, when will those clouds likely show up? In this case, the project was in the Palm Beach area. Clouds usually show up around 10 a.m. Which direction are the winds likely to come from? This will dictate how you do your mission planning. And how strong will they be over the course of the day? This may dictate how much flying you'll get in. Know the local air traffic. Who's likely to be flying in the area? And what are the local traffic patterns and how high should those people be flying? Let's look at our system. This is just one of our systems, but this is one we use quite a bit on large projects, the Firefly 6 Pro. The reason we chose it is because of its VTOL capabilities. A lot of the projects we work on leave us a very small space to launch and land in. This system takes off and returns up and down. In fact, it usually lands within a few feet of the target that it's sitting on in this picture. Flight time. Our system flies for about 40 minutes. Flight speed flies at about 30 knots. Coverage per flight. This is just a rule of thumb, but basically the altitude you're at is about the acreage you're going to cover, plus or minus 10%. Maximum allowable winds. 
This is very important. Our system will fly in winds up to 20 knots. More importantly, it'll launch and land in winds up to 20 knots. However, typically you wouldn't do that. Um, it takes an extreme amount of skill to do that. We prefer to, we prefer to fly in the 5 to 15 knot range. If I were to assign a skill level, I would say it takes a skill of about 7 out of 10 for a two-man crew to operate the system. Time between flights. Set up, fly, tear down. We average about an hour and 15 to an hour and 30 minutes. The payload. Camry we use is a Sony A6000. It has a 16 millimeter focal length lens. Sensor size, 6,000 by 4,000. Pixel size is 3.88 microns. It's a 24 megapixel camera. In this case, yes, we do calibrate this camera. It doesn't have its own onboard GPS, and the reason it doesn't have that is for buffering time. Typically, cameras with onboard GPS have to buffer that imagery. And when they're recording the GPS information to the EXIF file, sometimes that can take longer than the time between exposures, and therefore you miss images. So with the Firefly, we geotag the data with log file information from the aircraft itself. Sony A6000, just some rough information, typically what you would expect in uh, pixel resolution at a given altitude. The deliverable, in this case, an ortho mosaic. There wasn't an accuracy requirement. The resolution, six inches or better. Obviously, it's a large area, nine square miles, so it's gonna need to be tiled in the manageable blocks, and geo-referenced somewhat. In this case, it was GeoTIFF and it was in WGS84. The use, printed maps. Background images for CAD slash GIS. This is a sample of the imagery we captured. Interesting note, some people be thinking, Wow, there's a lot of work to be done in volumes down there. Ironically, in this case, the client does his own volumes with his own Phantom 4. The project site. Let's look at the conditions of the project site. 65% open fields. In this case, mostly sugarcane. 30% water. About 5% facilities. So what we have is great access with plenty of room to launch and land. The conditions. We're near the coast, which means it could be cloudy or get cloudy as the day progresses. And we did find this out. Burn season. Local conditions. You need to know your local conditions. And in this specific instance, they were burning sugarcane at this time. Fortunately for us, the burns were to our west and the winds were coming from the east, so we didn't have a lot of haze or overcast, but we could have from those burns. Mid-March weather in Florida. Winds were predominantly out of the southeast. They averaged about 8 to 20 knots, peaking at around 2 p.m. Local air traffic. We were 16 miles from the nearest large airport. The approach pattern did cross east to west, but well above us. Private runways in the area um, with occasional air traffic and maybe student pilots. I think we saw two aircraft through the area that we were working. Crop dusting activity. There were a lot of crop dusters working in the area 
but they were following the burns, so they weren't working in the fields or near the fields that we were in. Mission planning. With all these factors in mind, missions can be prepared. In this case, many of them. You'll note the nice pattern of flight lines going east to west here. Data is unruly. Do yourself a favor, develop a file structure, and stick to it. This is typically what ours looks like. We've created a template. This is what's in the template. Anytime we start a project, we follow the template. In this case, it's Correlator 3D. It could be Pix4D. It could be iKeros one button. And inside that folder is the folders that they typically generate. Data is huge. Develop a data management plan. And we're just gonna look at a couple things here. On the acquisition side, you know, have your ground control station with you. Um, in that, you should have your SOP, your manual, your logbooks, your mission plan, your mission planning software, so forth. You know, that's not a large amount of data in the megabytes. Field processing laptop. Typically, you're going to carry one of these with you as well, because your ground control station, although it may be a laptop, is very precious, and they also run on batteries you only want to be doing operational items with that ground control station slash laptop. Carry a field laptop, that way you can work in it on other things that you're planning on doing. Also have a backup drive. And in these two areas, you're gonna capture your log files, your images, and perhaps your GIS data. Now we're starting to talk about gigabytes of data. Data extraction. When you get back to the office, you've got a processing workstation, you've got a backup drive, you're going to transfer information between the two. You're going to start to carry more information. You've got your log files, your images, your GIS data. Now you're starting to process your outputs from your processing. These things can start to add up to terabytes. When you're done with all that, you want to archive that information. Again to a backup drive, over to backup storage, the data set may be typically the same size, maybe a little bit smaller. Still, you're talking large amounts of information. And then your client deliverable. That, again, typically becomes a manageable data set because you're not including the processing information. You're just including the deliverables. So mission planning begins in your mission planner, your GIS software. Typically for us, it begins in GIS software because this is where we start to call all the information together and do our planning. We look at it as a project management tool. So divide your project up into manageable flights based on optimal overlap and sidelap, acres of coverage per battery at a given altitude, site limitations, launch and landing points, and water. Create polygons for each proposed flight. In this case, they're color-coded, and these are just examples. Export these for use in your mission planning software. So we work in Mission Planner. And typically what we do is we import the shape files, select map, and then set our parameters. And you have a ton of parameters to set here. Your camera, you may run different cameras, uh, the altitude that you intend to fly, um, the direction of that camera, the angle that you want your flight lines, and so forth. You've also got your grid options. How much do you want the aircraft to overshoot your mapping area and lead in and come back in? What kind of overlap and side lap do you want? And based on those, you may also need lane separation. 
Now in this case we're creating an ortho mosaic, so the overlap and side lap we could minimize. And then verify your parameters. At the, once you set this information in Mission Planner, it will feed you basically the results and the amount of time and so forth that it's going to take to complete this mission. All of these are listed in your stats, even your resolution. When you're done with that, you generate a waypoint file. You're going to save this, and you're going to do the same for each block that you intend to fly. Mobilization. Make sure of the following. Make sure you have your waypoint files and that they are transferred from your workstation to your ground control station. Make sure all batteries are charged. Ground control station, UAS, cameras, phones, all of these things. Have them charged, have extra batteries. You may need a generator if necessary. In this case, we brought a generator with us because we were going to be working all day. Have a portable drive, maybe have two. Table, chairs, and sunshade. Suntan lotion. If you're going to be standing out there in the sun, you're going to get cooked. Safety gear. Again, depending on the project site, you may be required to have your vest, your steel toe boots, and your helmets with you. Survey equipment. If necessary, have the survey equipment you need. Make sure that's all charged and ready to go as well. SOP, manuals, insurance certificates, remote pilot's license. These things you should be carrying with you with your UAS at all times. Develop a checklist. We have a checklist for everything. This is our field equipment checklist. Once you're on site, Set up and get situated. Make sure you have plenty of room to work. That means typically each time you set up, the configuration should be familiar and the same. Your UAS should be positioned in one area, your ground control station in another area, your antenna in another area. So that way the people operating the UAS get familiar with the area and don't trip over things like a UAS. Make sure you have clear lines of sight. Make sure you have a safe launch and land area. And get settled in. Take a breath, relax, get ready for your mission. Begin your mission prep. We have a checklist for this as well. On site. In this case, our mission began at around 10 a.m. Our original plan was to fly east-west. However, once we got on site, we realized the winds are coming more at an angle from the east-southeast, and to minimize the effort on the UAS, we accommodated for these local winds. Now this minimized the crab and improved the efficiency of the firefly as it was in the air. So the upper left block was chosen as the first block due to its isolation. And as you can see, we captured imagery in a pattern through each block, ensuring that we had plenty of overlap. Excluding the first flight, we had about 4,046 images. Reflights. Some things are out of your control, especially these big white puffy things in the image. We had about four reflights due to clouds. Total time in the field, about two and a half days. Now between flights, this is what we were doing. You download your log files, you get your batteries charging, 
In this case, we carried three sets of batteries. Transfer imagery from your SD card. Review the imagery for quality. There's no need in tearing anything down yet unless the imagery looks good. So review that imagery. Once that's okay, you can go ahead and disassemble the Firefly. Once you have the log files from the Firefly, you can geotag the images. Now typically what we do is we load that flight path and the exposure points into a GIS and confirm we have full coverage, just as you see on the right. Then we tear down all re remaining equipment. This means the antenna, the tables and chairs, so forth, make sure everything's taken apart. Get everything ready to head to the next launch point. The total time with a crew of two from setup to tear down again and relocation in this case was about an hour, 15, hour and 30 minutes. Pre-processing. So ensure that your imagery and log files are backed up. And typically what we'll do is we'll take it from the ground control station to the field laptop, merge the data sets there, pre-process pre the imagery, geotag it, get the log files, and then we will back it up. And again, we use our standard file structure template. We'll place the data, imagery, geotagged imagery, log files, GIS data into their appropriate folders. Then, before we start processing, we thin the data. The Firefly does not turn off the camera during turns. You could write Mission Planner to do that, but it's probably overkill. So if you can thin the data, then you can reduce space used and you can reduce time used to process. So remove unnecessary overlap. In our case, we'll remove the turns, as you can see to the right. So originally the number of images captured was 4,046. After all the turns and unnecessary images were removed, the total number of images used went down to 3,056. Now again, typically we have time in the field or on our way back from a mission to do this type of work. It can be done in the office as well. Processing. This is very important. Processing just doesn't happen here. PIX4D, Drone Deploy, Agisoft, Drone to Map, Sim Active, Data Mapper, whichever one you use, that's your image processing software. That's all it is. Typically, you're going to want to use a GIS package to manage your data. I don't know if anybody remembers Manifold. I do. Um, QGIS, Esri, Global Mapper, all standard. You also need some image editing software. You've got options there as well. You've got GIMP and you've got Photoshop. And are you providing CAD deliverables? If the GIS package you're using can extract CAD deliverables into a CAD format, great. If not, you're going to want to be able to do some translation. So the workflow on this project. In QGIS, we did the project setup, mission planning, pre-processing, data review, and created the tile schema. In SimActive, we did the image processing. In GIMP, we did some editing, primarily water in this case. And then in QGIS, we went back in, did some formatting, ensuring the tile schema, and producing the deliverables. Image processing. In this case, we, used, we chose to use SimActive. SimActive is great at doing large areas quickly. So what we typically do is load the imagery, and I don't have a graphic for that. It's very intuitive. Perform the AT, in this case on the right, um, running the tie points. Then run, run a bundle adjustment. Now, being that we're providing a 
mosaic without ground control, um, it was a very quick process. Um, we didn't have to match to control, therefore running the bundle adjustment was fairly straightforward. We like to generate a course TTM um, for the orthos to be produced and the mosaic to be generated from. I don't think that in a case like this you have to go to a full DSM and so on because we're creating what is more of a flat ortho and a flat mosaic. It's Florida. Ortho rectification. The nice thing about SimActive is, is it allows you to set the area of the image that you want orthorectified. So, for example, if you went out and captured 80% overlap and 80% side lap, and you realized, wow, I have way too much imagery, um, you could set that image area, the crop area, to 40%. And what that means is it would get rid of the outer 40% of the image. In our case, we collected at 70% forward overlap and 60% side lap. But we could reduce the amount of imagery being orthorectified. In this case, we set it at 20%. Now, another benefit of that is, is that imagery tends to degrade the farther away from the center you get. So if you can crop that out, it's probably going to give you a better result. We set our output resolution at 6 inch. Set the output format, GeoTIFF, and generated the ortho. I'm sorry, in this case, generated the ortho, I skipped all the way to the mosaic. So this is basically what the mosaic of the entire area looked like. Then all we had to do was output to the tile schema, do a little bit of editing, and as you can see, seam light editing is pretty straightforward and simple. In this case, again, most of what we flew was fields and water. There wasn't much editing to do. We did come across a couple facilities and we did try to improve the way those came out. And in SimActive, you can also color balance your ortho mosaic, which is kind of nice. So here's just a couple images some of the detail that we captured. This is Big John and Little John, or should I say Little John on the left and Big John on the right. Again, some of the areas that you would think great opportunity for volumes. And um, a local FPNL uh, power station. Now, I did mention that we do a little bit of image editing because when you produce mosaics from small images, which UAS images are, and it takes 600 images to cover a square mile, you're going to have a lot of variation in color. And you're especially going to see that over water. So you can see in these areas, you've got some variation in color based on how the sun was reflecting off the water at the time we flew over it. And it creates somewhat not so pretty of an image. It creates what maybe looks like turbidity in the imagery. In GIMP, we went in and edited some of that water information. You don't want to make it perfect, but you want to make it look better. And in this case, we did that. Final deliverables. So this is what our tile schema looked like. What we had to provide was an ortho mosaic, six inch resolution imagery, tiled in GeoTIFF and TFW format. Provide basic metrics on the project and the deliverables in a final project report. Doesn't have to be overly detailed, but give your client the information as to what you did and how you did it and what the deliverables are. Now you got to move on to archiving all that data because you have a workstation most likely full of information. 
clean up your data. Go in there and find iterations of processing that weren't used. Maybe miscellaneous information that was placed in there randomly. Clean that data up. Remove all your unnecessary files. Back up your data. Ensure that you have everything to recreate the project somewhere. In fact, have it two somewheres. And by that, I mean archive your data. Archive it on a separate drive that is placed in a safe, hopefully climate controlled location. I'm sure most of you are aware that drives are only guaranteed for about two years. Keep that in mind. And then ship or transfer your deliverables to the client. Now in this case, we were looking at nine square miles. It was easy enough to put this information on a drive and to deliver it to the client. Deliver what was asked for. Now this is a twofold thing. Give the client what they wanted. That's very important. But also, don't give them what they don't need. I come from the mobile LiDAR mapping world. There was a big push to push LiDAR point clouds on the end user. The reality was the end user works in CAD and couldn't even open a LiDAR point cloud. Don't give them what they don't need. Deliver what they asked for. Again, here's our information. If you have questions, please feel free to email us. I hope this presentation was of value to you. We're always available to answer questions. Thank you.